Vicky Hayward, I'm the chairman of the RSA, and as you can see, there was absolutely no interest at all in taking part in this evening's event. So as long as Nick and I don't fall off the stage, we should be able to get through the first few moments. Thank you so much for coming this evening to this fantastically well-supported event, Nations on the World Stage. Sometimes I am challenged as chairman of the RSA that the arts in our title is not always something that we're concentrating on. And I spend some of my time telling people that that certainly isn't true. And just this week alone has very much proved the point to me as I sat down and read the Gilbenkin report, which, he, which we are partners on, on the civic role of the arts, which is part one of a report that they're creating. And secondly, I was chairing our Learning About Culture project, which is uh, an extraordinarily huge research project, which we are doing in collaboration with the Education Endowment Fund and the Arts Council and the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And it's really going to be an extremely interesting two-year research project on proving the value of creativity in education. And thirdly, this evening's event. Thank you very much to Mark for hosting this panel and good luck. <laughs> but it is my very great honor to be able to welcome Nick Sirota to the stage. Um, I think this is your first official event as chairman of the Arts Council at the RSA. And um, it gives me the opportunity to both congratulate you on your appointment, but also to thank you for putting up your hand for what is such an important job for us in the arts today. You hold in your arms the whole of the aspirations of the arts community, and you know that you do. And you also know, I think, that we have enormous faith in you, Nick, as chairman of the Arts Council, and a huge gratitude and thank you very much for taking on that role because it's very important and particularly important in this changing world. Thank you very much. Um, Vicky, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's no pressure then, Vicky, I understand. Um, you said it's a changing world and of course, if you look across the world today, one has to be very conscious that the actions of nations and indeed the actions of individuals are very much governed by the notions of interdependence rather than independence and that makes life much much more difficult and if you look at the result of the referendum it seems to me that it suggests that there was here or is here a certain yearning for a stability a certain wish to not so much withdraw from the world, because of course we're told all the time that we must look out, and indeed we do look out, but rather more just for a set of values that are perhaps less frequently challenged than some of the values have been in recent years. Brexit is an economic issue, it's a political issue, but it's very much also a personal, a social and a psychological question. And that's why I think it's so important that we're here today because the theater is incredibly well placed to open up some of those questions for discussion and debate. And this collaboration between four theaters in four nations strikes me as being a really, it's not only original in its form, but it's also, I hope, is going to shed new light um, from the point of view of uh, new writing um, and different perspectives. So we at the Arts Council are really thrilled that this is happening. I do want to thank the RSA for hosting this evening and Vicky says that occasionally the RSA is perhaps accused of not doing enough in the field of the arts, but frankly this kind of event is a really big contribution. And I do want to thank also uh, James Dacre um, for inviting me to come this evening, but also in a way for initiating this whole program. So, Mark, over to you, and I look forward to the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. So, there are three parts to um, this evening. At the end of all this, um, James Dacre and David Gregg will announce um, a cycle of plays that will look at uh, 
all parts of the Great Britain um, up to roughly 2027. Uh, we're going to have a debate between um, these seven playwrights for a while, uh, and then we'll open it up to you, and there'll be microphones out in the audience. Um, when we get to that bit, can I just ask, as I always do on these occasions, no matter how famous you may think you are in the um, uh, arts world, if you could just tell us who you are so that people who might have missed out on you for some reason know um, <laughs> what perspective you're coming from. Um, the topic for tonight is how should theatre respond to and reflect the changing role of Great Britain, Northern Ireland and Europe over the next decade? So the length of time is important. They were going beyond 2019. We're going up to a period when Sixtus Rees Mogg, currently a baby, may be leader of the Young Conservatives by the time um, uh, this cycle is over. Um, playwrights are used to attracting a starry cast to their work, but this is a starry cast of playwrights. Um, I'll introduce seven, and then they'll make a brief statement, um, a short speech, each of them, and then we'll knock a few things around, and then we'll open it up to you. Um, Brad Birch. Uh, his plays include Permafrost and The Brink, and he was the recipient last year of the Harold Pinter Commission to write a new play for the Royal Court. Tanika Gupta, um, her plays include Sanctuary, Sugar Mummies, and her adaptation recently, Anita and Me, which I saw in Birmingham and was tremendous, um, as indeed is all the work represented here, pretty much. Because <laughs> I, um, I know how competitive playwrights are, so... Um, <laughs> It's just a matter of different brilliances among the um, seven people yeah. on the panel. Um, James Graham, who will blush, but he is, we believe, I believe, the first writer since Alan Aikborn to have two new plays in adjoining West End theatres um, at different points in St. Martin's Lane. At the moment, you can see Ink uh, by James and Labour of Love by James, theatres next door to each other. The subject matter of the plays um, producing a rare example of Rupert Murdoch and Jeremy Corbyn being side by side. Um, next year, this house goes um, on tour, and in November, quiz um, about a coughing major, alleged coughing major, we have to say, don't we, James? Um, incident on TV um, opens at, Ch at Chichester. Uh, then April De Angelis, uh, plays include Breathless, um, Hush, The Positive Hour, um, Jumpy, which is a great role for Tams and Greg, and James has got another great role for Tams and Greg um, in Labour of Love. Uh, Roy Williams, uh, his plays include Sing Your Heart Out for the Lads, um, in my personal view, the best play ever written about football. Um, Sucker Punch, uh, one of the best plays ever written about boxing. Um, <laughs> and uh, Fallout, um, which I don't know, I'm not gonna rank that one, but anyway, that was... Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, a great play about um, British uh, society at the time. And then we have um, Rosemary uh, Jenkinson, whose plays include Pla uh, Planet Belfast, which gives you a sense of where she comes from, Stella Morgan, um, and Love or Money. Have you seen them? Um, I have seen one of your plays, yes. Um, I, uh, I saw Planet Belfast, amazingly, while I was wow. in Planet Belfast. So there you, go. so there you are. Good stuff. And... Um, <laughs> Then Kwame Kwe Armar, this is nostalgic for me, we spent many nights um, broadcasting on TV in the past. Um, his plays include a trilogy uh, uh, at the National Theatre, Almina's Kitchen, Fix Up, and Statement of Regret. He is currently Artistic Director of Centre Stage in Baltimore, um, and uh, directing as well at the moment, um, One Night in Miami, another great play about boxing actually, um, although not as good as Roy's obviously, was at the, um, uh, he, he directed at the Donmar, um, and currently directing a new version, modernization of Ibsen's The Lady from the Sea. Um, so opening statements, please. Um, we didn't draw lots. We, well, basically, I told Roy you had to go first. Yeah. So, Roy, um, if you could go first, please. Sure. How theatre should respond to and reflect the changing role of Britain in Europe over the next decade is by presenting itself in its most honest and truest form. I believe that by telling a good story first and foremost, Secondly, by celebrating as well as questioning what it means to live a life, all of our lives, not the select few and that some feel is more worthy or more important than others, all of our lives, British lives, European lives, worldwide lives. Not one society, not one race or any creed should be overlooked. 
We find each other's flaws. We debate our flaws. We question our flaws. We argue against each other's flaws. We share our flaws. We learn from our flaws. We do so also by opening our windows and taking a good long look at what Britain looks like now. Not what some may want it to look like or how it used to look like before, but how it looks like now. Not just on the surface or even in depth, but also, and perhaps more importantly, between the cracks. Because that is what makes us all human, the cracks. Otherwise, I will continue to know who theatre in this country is for, but not what it's for. Thank you very much, Roy. And um, second uh, statement, please, from Tanika Gupta. Um, I would like to start by saying, um, rather than looking uh, ahead, I'd like to look at what's been happening up until now and how, how we can change that so that we do move forward. And um, my big problem with theatre, even though I work in it, is it is monocultural uh, and extremely uh, Eurocentric. And I think the stories that are out there are not getting, to you know, the, the stories of a diverse community are not getting told on our major stages. I think that some of the national theatres have failed abysmally to actually include people. And when I say include, I mean I'm talking about writers and actors and, write, uh, and directors. So that we do have, we still have one story being told um, without taking away from any of the brilliance of the stories that are there out there. I, I would like to pose the question so that we can look forward to actually asking who is holding the pen, who are writing the stories, and whose stories are being told. And at the moment, it doesn't feel like enough diversity or what we should, what we should term as inclusivity uh, is being in, involved in the theater generally. And I would really like to see a world in the future in Britain, in UK, and in Europe, where we actually tell everybody's stories and not just one strand. Thank you very much. Um, and the uh, third speaker is, uh, where are you? There you are, Rosemary Jenkinson. Thank you. Uh, so first, the big divorce. Then we leave <laughs> the single market to go on the singles market. <laughs> but what happens to the kids? What about the problem child of Northern Ireland? Unloved by England and Ireland, but still coveted by both. Are we prepared for the breakup of the Union? Northern Ireland voted mainly to stay in Europe, so Irish nationalism is being reignited under the guise of Europhilia. So one th question for theatre is, how do we playwrights respond rapidly to Brexit? When it's the great unpredictable unknown, do we risk looking stupid if we write plays with doomsday scenarios that never transpire? But the main question for theatre is, are we keen on raising the ugly head of nationalism that has been contained for the past 20 years by the peace process? I've got used to skipping back and forth across the Irish border without a thought in the world. Am I, as a Northern Irish writer, ready to write according to my tribal lines? I'm a Protestant, but I haven't been forced to pick a side in years, and it's been wonderful not to be labelled. For us, the huge challenge of Brexit is how to respond without putting theatre and politics back years. Brexit means either Northern Ireland is strengthened in its Britishness by an by an economy that splits partially from the South, or Northern Ireland is inspired by Irish nationalism to break from the Union and join Ireland in the EU. Either way, theatre has to respond by imagining the future violence that might ensue. But can we do this without religious bias? The last thing we want is to be unionist or nationalist playwrights. Thank you very much. Uh, James Graham. Um, I, I'm really inspired already by some of the answers that people are suggesting. I only have questions and I feel incredibly lost most of the time. Um, I think as a writer who tries to or pretends to uh, respond to events, I think the main challenge often is how the hell you keep up with events uh, that seem to spiral so quickly out of control. Um, but I think the problems or the challenges facing theatre are the ones facing politics at the moment. If you look at how language has changed in our political discourse over the past 
few years, um, words like open and free and community are being replaced by words like closed and protection and um, even the bill that go through Parliament at the moment, uh, the word is withdrawal, um, and there's something about that word, regardless of whether you voted leave or remain, whether you want to stay or whether you want to go, there's something about that word which really scares me and feels really defeatist. The idea of withdrawing from something um, is not what feels like theatre should be. It feels like theatre should connect and engage and look at something in the eye. Um, I think we're facing challenges um, as a, as a world and a community anyway in, in the way that art is being made and uh, digested. It's becoming increasingly more private um, and atomised, even things that used to be collective, like watching a movie in a cinema or watching a TV drama with your family around one television rather than six different screens and uh, each family member in a different room. So theatre, for me, and it sounds probably overly romantic and overly sentimental, but it's one of the last remaining um, forums to get a community of people together um, and explore an idea that can be complex and nuanced and even um, disconcerting and challenging to you outside of your bubble, the bubble of your feed where you block ideas that you don't enjoy. I feel that that um, is a challenge because that's not the way that conversation and discourse is going. It's becoming more restricted and becoming more closed and theatre is all about being open. Um, but I think it presents an opportunity and a responsibility to somehow get, drag ourselves out of whatever that word bubble means, whether it means your political bubble, whether it means your, your geographical bubble, uh, your community, and into a space where uncomfortable and difficult ideas can hopefully be, um, be uh, discussed with uh, a word I sort of treasure, but I think is often frowned upon in theatre, uh, which is balance and nuance and uh, living in the grey. So that's what I'm going to aspire to do, but you're going to tell me how to do that because I've got no idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, April Dan, um, Yeah, it's Brexit. How is theatre going to respond to Brexit? Um, if you, I mean, from my perspective, Brexit, Brexit isn't so much going to cause a cause as a that's going to have forward-going implications, which it is. But I'd rather look, look at it as a symptom, and a symptom of what's been happening in Britain um, in terms of monetarism and in terms of governments since 1979 that have been basically, government's been a mechanism for taking wealth from everybody and stripping it and giving it to a minority. And, um, and that, so, in a sense, theatre, you know, the, what is the point of theatre if it's not for everybody? What, if, what, if, what is the point of theatre if it's for a, for a minority? How can you sit here and argue that theatre is important when some people can't feed their children? You know, I don't want to do that. I want to live in a world where people can afford to feed their children, where we're not having a government that robs, robs us um, and for, for the few. I want, I want uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, a CEO of a company earned 20 times that of an average worker. Today, he or she earns 150 times, and that's figures from Jeremy Corbyn, so thank you, Jeremy. Um, I want theatre, so what are the challenge for playwrights is how do we address that, that, awful, that inequality? And it's not a new question. It's a question that should have, that's been with us since 1979. Thank you. Brad Bird. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, how should theatre respond to... Um, I, kind of, I, I, struggled, I struggled with the question. I struggled with should and art. Um, I, I, think, I think that's not a good word because it makes it feel like school. So I think how can theatre respond is a slightly better question for me to What Well, you could with. ask should theatre respond? Should theatre respond yeah. at all, yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, so maybe we'll come to that. Um, <laughs> um, um, how, how can theatre respond? I think, I think um, we need to do something a bit different than... Uh, describing what's happening. Um, we were told really clearly what was definitely going to happen before the referendum, and then after the referendum we were told exactly why it didn't happen. Um, and and I, think, I, think, I think we need to avoid punditry, and I think that the gesture of art can offer something a bit different. And I think I find inspiration in the medium of the uh, fragrance advert. Um, I find them fascinating. I, I, I kind of love them. Because um, the, the, the one thing they very can't do is just tell you what the thing smells like. <laughs> so what they have to do instead is they have to use symbol and metaphor and language and different ways of trying to evoke the feeling that you will feel when you smell that fragrance. So the question for me is, what does Brexit smell like? Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> um, and I think if, if, we can, if we can look at trying to crack that, well, what is the feeling of Brexit? What, what brought us here and, and where is it taking us? Um, without having to mention Michael Gove, um, that would be my kind of where I'm aiming towards. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to start with that, the smell of Brexit, because um, what, 
Kwame. Oh, Kwame, God, I've gone. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> God, yes. Kwame. You got away with it. I almost did. <laughs> it's because I couldn't read my handwriting and I, I thought you were going. Yeah, no I'm worries. really sorry, Kwame. No, no worries at all. Um, um, I, I think the challenge of Brexit for theatre in an increasingly borderless world is, um, is do we want what Nick said? Do we want interdependence? I think that theatre in Britain has practiced Brexit for as long as I can remember. I think we privilege the English word. We even take the Scandinavian stuff and kind of nice it up and make it really English. So we actually think that Ibsen is from Northampton. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I, I, I think the big question for me is actually, do we, do we care? Do we, it's all with our nice liberal progressive sensibilities that we think that most of us artists are until we crack our first couple of million and have to pay a lot of tax. Um, do, 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 you know, do we actually care? The privileging of the English language, we've, and we think about internationalism invariably through the lens of, well, there's this British new play, and there's this English new play, and there's this Irish new play, and then there's this American new play, and then there's this Scandinavian that really looks like British. And, and I'm really interested in how we integrate with Europe on this plays that we actually put on our stages, on the plays that we commission, and how we, how we approach it in a way that actually opera does. Opera's not afraid of internationalism. It's not afraid of language. And, and I think we are. What do we do about that? That's an um, interesting question, isn't it? Because obviously, um, opera, I mean, uh, just down the road, English National Opera is, um, they're translated into English uh, surtitles. And, uh, because language is the key thing in theatre, isn't it? That we have always translated the plays. Some are done with surtitles. But is that what you're suggesting? Uh, Keep well, them in the original language? I, I, I don't know. I'd be interested mm. in the experiment. I know that mm. the best Julius Caesar I ever saw was in Milan. I don't speak Italian. And, um, of course, I knew the plot. But the production was magnificent, and I was in it every beat of the way. And I don't know if I could see that production other than in a presenting house rather than a producing house. Um, okay, seven uh, tremendous opening statements. I thought we're going, we're being screened online as well, so um, we've got a large audience beyond. We'll talk for a bit, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Picking up on Brad's point about the smell of Brexit and James's point about balance and nuance, um, this seems to be crucial because. Brexit smells differently to some people, even in the cabinet. To some people it smells fragrant, and to other people it smells um, noxious and unpleasant. Um, this is the second uh, great debate about Brexit today. There was a cabinet meeting this morning that apparently lasted several hours and was very argumentative. So we're going to aim for something that is half the length and twice as disputatious, <laughs> please, from um, the panel. Um, but that question of balance, because um, Certainly on the day of the referendum, 52-48, we suspect, although I don't have a survey to hand, but we suspect that in the theatre world, um, maybe rather more than 48% um, uh, pro-European. Um, so can we talk about how we handle that? Do you, um, should any season of plays be 48-52 balance? Should any play be 42-58 balance? Um, 40, sorry, 48-52. Uh, how do you do that? Um, to what extent, this seems to be a big question, to what extent are you prepared to disagree with people in the audience or have people in the audience disagreeing with you, James? God, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um. I suppose it's uh, almost to Tanika's point. It's about actually finding, finding those those voices. I mean, you can fake it yourself. You can be a Remain voter and pretend to to walk in the shoes of a Leave voter um, and try and write that play. Or I guess you can just name the debate and have the debate between characters on the stage. Um, I did. I've just I'm just done a play about Rupert Murdoch where. Um, I, I took the decision to uh, to to uh, not necessarily string him up and 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 hold him to account in the way that I think other playwrights necessarily would. And I really want to see that other version of that play. Um, I have to admit, it was sort of thrilling to be at the Almeida in Islington and watch lots of Guardian readers come mm. out going, "Oh God, I think I like him," and then <laughs> and then me thinking, "Oh God, I've gone too far the other way," and uh, having to pull it back. But it's I, you know a lot of these issues to do with Brexit, as April has said, are incredibly serious and. Um, I, I don't think balance means compromise. I don't think balance means wooliness or toothlessness. Uh, I, 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 relish the, I relish finding territory that, that embraces all the contradictions. And I, I, I also agree with what Brad said. I don't think theatre is journalism, and nor should it be. I don't think it's a list of facts and a chronology of events. 
I think, um, for me, the power of theatre, and particularly political theatre, has always been uh, narrative and, and metaphor. I think the best political play ever is not... Arthur Miller could have done a verbatim play about the McCarthy trials uh, two weeks after it happened, and actually he didn't. He waited a couple of years and did what I think is the best political allegory of all time in the form of the crucible. So my get-out clause is saying I'm not going to touch it for three years. Uh, and I'm going <laughs> to wait and see what it, what it means, because I don't think you can know what something means until it's, it's run its course. Um, April, on that, uh, to what extent um, balance in plays about Brexit and post-Brexit, we're looking 10 years ahead. I mean, the talks may still be going on in 10 years, who knows, but uh, <laughs> that's, um, yeah. Well, I don't think balance is a very, I mean, I always find that word really weird. It's like if you were writing a play about Nazi Germany, would you write balance between <laughs> Hitler and sort of, you know, the Jewish population? You wouldn't, would, you can't, there isn't balance, but you do look for conflict, and you do place, as a playwright, you would place your conflict um, in provocative and challenging ways, and hopefully there wouldn't be easy answers. So, uh, you know, for example, looking at Brexit, you know, the stupid people that voted for Brexit, working class people, probably, that is that, is that a, you know, uh, that connection's sort of been made. I mean, are, are these, are these really angry and how- Are you saying they were stupid? No, I think they were, at, well, I, I think they were, they, there was, their mythology, there's a mythology that they bought into about nationalism that's not, wasn't politicized, so I'd say that. I don't think that's stupid. I think, you know, we all fall for myth mythologies, don't we? Um, one of them being that working class people are stupid, perhaps that's a mythology. But, um, anyway, to get to my point, um, you know, you, you, you want to provoke and challenge and overturn and make people look at themselves and not make people feel complacent. So that, and I think if that, that's, that's what theatre does. I don't know if that's ba what balance quite has to do with that. But the stupid people have voted for Brexit, that would be a provocative title for a <laughs> well, play, wouldn't it? You could, well, of um, course it would, but if you just yeah. delivered that very yeah. simply, then it'd be a really yeah. boring play, wouldn't it? Um, Kwame, I think it's uh, um, Michael Frayne, it was, who said that in a, a good play, every character is right, didn't he? Pete, a lot of playwrights have said versions of that. That's exactly where I was going, yeah. so I don't need to say it. No, no, no go on. Uh, yeah. no, I, I was going to say that, that, that ultimately, I think our job as playwrights is to love every character that we put on the page. And, um, and so I think that our, our challenge is that we have to seek balance. Uh, I, James Baldwin, in his play Blues for Mr. Charlie, um, taught me something about white supremacy in a way that allowed me to, be, uh, to have empathy for it. In that play, um, a, a young man from the South goes up North and he gets ideas about civil rights and he brings it back to the South and, and this white supremacist kills him. And in the last scene, or penultimate scene, um, when the guy's asked why he killed the, the young man, he says, because I'm a parent. And as a parent, we want our children to inherit more than we do. And what kind of man would I be? What kind of father would I be if I allowed my child to inherit less because I took the demands of this northern agitator? My children would inherit less. And I know what that did for me in terms of the way that I looked at the white majority and structural racism and structural inequality. It allowed me to take a look at it through the lens of what do they feel that they are losing? And so um, I ultimately feel that it's our job to have balance and to love every character and to also have a point of view that we're willing to defend. I think we can have both objectivity and subjectivity. That's our gig. Rosemary, that, um, that Chinese proverb, much quoted, may live in interesting times. You have that in um, Northern Ireland at the moment. The, um, the future of the current government depends on Northern Ireland. Uh, the future of the outcome of the Brexit talks almost certainly depends on Northern Ireland. It's one of the three red lines. Um, but you mentioned in your talk that uh, balance in a Northern Irish context, um, as the BBC have discovered over the decades, is a hugely complex because neither side will accept that it is balance. Yeah, well, that's really the thing. I'm just saying that you are put very much in a position where you have to take one side. I mean, it's so divided, sort of, and even like, uh, you know, our, our population between Protestant and Catholic are so equal now, and it's just like, you just feel like you have to go one way, make a decision to go one way, and it's, it's, a, it's very difficult. But as I say, we are... I kind of welcome as a playwright interesting times. So I have to say that it is great actually that 
London is paying us attention and on this. Uh, I mean, they actually are Googling the DUP. Their website crashed. I mean, they, yeah. they can't even believe this. So um, it's good to be in the news, not for the best things, but uh, at least we're not being ignored. Um, we may not bring in everyone on every round, but we'll see if anyone wants to say anything on this, the question of balance and... Um, there was, there was a meeting that we all went to as playwrights uh, uh, some time ago where a Tory minister accused us all of... Uh, he actually said, why do none of you write right-wing plays? And we all kind of looked at each other and we, we could think of one person, but I won't mention him for libel. But, um, well, it's not but libel he was to call somebody right-wing. He, <laughs> was, just like, he was it, Rich, Richard Bean. Um, no, 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 it wasn't Richard Bean. Oh. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, then he accused uh, Lu Lucy Preble of writing an uh, um, anti-capitalist play. And we all kind of like sat around and kind of looked at each other and thought, we just write plays. We don't necessarily think that we're left-wing, we're presenting uh, a world. But actually, to him, he felt that we were all left-wingers and Marxists and we were all knocking... The Tory government and uh, this was around the time of Brexit as well and I think that certainly you I think as a playwright you never think of writing balanced plays uh, for, as, uh, for myself when I come out and see people vomiting or crying or shouting in the toilets I'm delighted because I've had some sort of reaction and also that whole thing that we're talking about that you are you're presenting human beings and it's like you know you can have a family where somebody's voted brexit and the others haven't and everyone's shouting at each other that's conflict that's drama doesn't mean that you absolutely hate each other till the end of the days but it's quite it it, it is a very difficult time at the moment with, mm. in terms of those sort of viewpoints right no just to add to that i just um, I, I remember when um Obviously, um, the march against um, the war in Iraq in, in 2003 and then subsequent dramas is what came from that. And it came to a point when I just thought, if I see one more play about old Tony Blair lie, George Bush lie, I would scream. <laughs> I almost want to give me a play that dares me to you know, support the war. Not that I would in a million years, but I wanted, I wanted some drama, some fiction that, um, that would dare me to do that. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the words we've been saying about... Um, um, what was he said, a Kwame, um, oh, sorry. Um, I don't know, so it went in and went out. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> balance. balance. Balance, balance, that's it, balance. Yes, that's what, that's what but also, like I said in my, in, in my introduction, it's about the cracks, Go, going in, mm. in, in between. And, and also, to, to pick up on what Tanika said, it's, um, I, I, you know, I'm not looking for a, you know, a balanced play that sort of says that. I just, um, I want to be surprised when I see a, a theatre piece. And also, I wanted to, you know, in, in spite of the, the beliefs I may have about Brexit or whatever, and I do have views about Brexit, um, but I think what will make the world very interesting is, you know, to, again, okay, but see it from this point of view. And I, in, in a way, I think that makes us all liberal in a weird way, whether you like it or not, by, by inviting that question in the first place. I was very struck by that, because um, Edinburgh Festival this year, I saw um, five satires about Donald Trump in a row on the same day. <laughs> and um, every single play uh, took the same attitude towards Trump. Everyone in the audience yeah. thought the same thing. Yeah. And I thought, like you, well, could we see one that defends him? He's an awesome. Yeah. We know that. He's a, yeah. a card-carrying yeah. dickhead. Yeah. Yeah. A caveat yeah. for that as well. That, um, I, think it's a re I think it's a really clever way of trying to get in on our patch a little bit as well. That, 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 that if, if, if we look... I completely understand around understanding and empathy, and um, but if, if we look at the wider culture, there aren't many um, areas of the left and of the liberal. Um, if we look at what's in the news every day, the way in which things are framed, the way in which the newspapers run amok, and now they're telling us that our th and also the theatre of Julian Fellows isn't the theatre of the left either. So 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 we don't you know, you know we, we we don't we don't own this space. But Julian Fellows was the right wing. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's interesting. So yeah. you also just say the theatre is the balance to the newspaper. No, I don't. I, I don't think we come anywhere near being a balance. I think we're a drop in the ocean. Um, but I think, um, I, though, I completely take all, all those points and completely agree as well. I just think a slight caveat of let's not let's not get carried away and and, mm. and trying to you know kind of lose 
lose actually but also, in, in sorry, intellectual right. space. Uh, and I'd like to support that in an odd way, because I, I think when we write our plays, and particularly when they're published, um, these are acts of history, that you go back and you look at a time and you go, oh, that's what was happening in the nuances, in the cracks. This was a view, and invariably history leans to the right. And so to find documents that actually speak, and it doesn't even have to speak from the left, but just doesn't support a right-leaning status quo agenda, actually is tremendously important. And I think it's, it, it's very important for us as artists to remember that these are historical documents. But one of the um, strangest and most interesting <laughs> a atmospheres I've ever experienced in a theatre was in Stuff Happens, Nash um, David Hare of the National Theatre. There's that one speech where a journalist defends the, um, reputedly based on Nick Cohen, the Observer, defends the Iraq war. And the resentment and horror in the audience of the Olivier was a spectacular thing to behold. So sometimes the audience will resist um, any attempt to tell them something they don't agree with. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think you'll find a play right. I'm pretty certain David Hare is very. I mean, I, I, I remember I was in a meeting with him, the function. I think, were you there as well, Tony Carr? I think that was the same meeting. That was the same, yeah. Yes, when he started Where jabbing, he and yeah. um, He and Julian Fellows just absolutely just you know, went at each other for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. So it's just interesting that you know, a playwright like David, David Hare would write that speech. And we were all sitting there thinking this would make a great two-hander. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the next uh, subject I want to discuss before we open it up is, um, which came up, is the question of keeping up with events. We're in a situation, this cycle of plays is going to look ahead a decade, um, you'd have to be fairly brave to bet who will be Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary by Saturday. So um, <laughs> it's, um, how do you write plays in uh, that context? Again, I saw, uh, it was very funny, I saw a production in Edinburgh called Brexit, the musical, but it was about, the jokes were about a year out of date. They were about Andrew Ledson loving children and all this kind of stuff, and all this other stuff had happened. Um, so this is the problem, that um, history, well, news will not stay still. That's the problem. How do you deal with that? Who would like to? Metaphor. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's the key for me anyway. I know certainly as a political playwright, certainly in my early days, I, 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 I just wanted to get my view across. As I've moved into directing a bit, um, metaphor is the, is the great tool. And it's also, it gives you plausible deniability as well, um, if, if you need it and, uh, at, at any moment. But I, I think finding the metaphor um, is, is the key to, to keeping up with events, because you, you can't, you can't, you know, particularly in America where I live at the moment, um, you know, every day there's an, as we all know, there's a new tweet that's going in a different direction. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and if you try to keep, and if you try and create a narrative around even understanding why tweet one was different from tweet two, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you, you're, you're lost or you're just going into the land of being a pundit and you want to be on TV just talking. So I, I, I think, to repeat myself, I think the challenge is finding the metaphor, finding the historical works that speak to the time and the error, if not specificity. All parallels, I can ask you, James, that because we worry about uh, political plays being overtaken by events. They can be taken up by events. You had this with this house where... Um, the first run of it coincided with a minority government, and then, well, we don't know. I mean, who knows what the government will be when it comes back next year and goes on to a bit. Um, that, so it's interesting. So it's both historical and topical, this house. Uh, yes, well, I had no idea when I wrote a play about minority governments that it would prove so lucrative. I thought it was going to be uh, absolutely only 12 people were going to go and see it and it would never be relevant again. But it's, I, I entirely agree with Kwame, actually, and I was going to say uh, my... It's not a trick. I mean, Shakespeare did it and the Greeks did it, but for me, it's just useful to, to use history to go, go back to the past and find equivalent events to make sense of what's happening now and just by definition or by default that provides a historical context um, and a longer lens view of what's happening so you don't have to worry about um, keeping up with contemporary events. That's why we still do it. That's why we still, when, you know, in any war, any conflict, any, any fall of a leader, we still re revert back to some of those 500, 1,000 year old plays because mm. they have the durability and the broadness to their scope that just speaks to what it is to be a human and to try and organize your society in a different way and probably fail. Um, also, I was, I've, I've started, I was researching Brexit and the, the campaign for a particular project. Um, and it was, I, somewhat, I forget, somebody on the, in the Remain campaign 
uh, said to me, they tried to describe the moment they realized that they'd been duped into holding the referendum uh, in the way that it felt like two people of equal, uh, equal sides coming to, to, a, to a shootout. Um, and going, let's have this referendum. We will start. We have, we'll both have six weeks, and it'll be all. It'll be an equal campaign. And, and the Remain side went, great, okay, cool. And the moment they realised, about three weeks into the campaign, that it didn't start six uh, weeks ago. It started 25 years ago. Mm. And the Leave side had been fighting this for 25 years, and then they pretended to start six weeks ago. And just the way the Remain campaign is reminded me that if you to, to tackle Brexit is not necessarily to write the Michael Gove play. It, these fault lines began way, 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 way back in our, in our history, and it's about Britain, it's about this country, and so um, I would, uh, you could pick any moment, I think, since the 1950s, and it would speak to Brexit. But also the practice of the, the political types and the political tactics are so unchanged. I mean, that's why Julius Caesar, I mean, they did a specific Trump production in America, but... Um, Gore Vidal's The Best Man is a bad revive, written in 1960, but one of the characters is a crazed southern populist who um, is, I mean, clearly they're going to make um, a connection with uh, somebody with a home um, in the south, his, uh, his Florida home. Um, but that, uh, and um, Waste, Harley Granville Barker, which is about the dis uh, a bill to establish the Church of England. But again, all those types are still recognisable in politics, although they tend, but this is true in politics, I mean, they tend to be men very largely, but, um, but a play can find its moment even if, which is what we're saying, if, even if not written for it. I mean, I, I, I have to say that I've just finished, um, I, I had a show on at the Globe on, uh, that just finished on Saturday, and that was a historical play, and it was actually based on my great uncle who was a freedom fighter in India, and because it's 70 years since Indian independence this year, the play finally went on after 20 years of trying to get the damn thing on. And uh, basically what happens, my 19-year-old great-uncle uh, broke into writer's building in Calcutta, shot and killed the inspector general of prisons, and then shot himself. Uh, but it didn't manage to kill himself. And uh, the Brits took the bullet out, and then six months later they hanged him. And so the, the, the play was about him, basically, and about it, the, the fight for it freedom and independence but actually what ended up happening was the play ended up being about the young and the old basically my great uncle says in one of his letters from prison nobody over the age of 60 should be allowed to vote because they get it wrong and they don't understand young people and this is back in 1930 and so it's it's that same thing about metaphor it's about you put a play on which is historical and actually just speaks to everybody now these you know these boys were uh, freedom fighters as in they were Hindu, and they, and they believed in armed insurrection, which is not very different to what's going on at the moment, but they were not Muslims, um, and the Brits were fighting them all the way, <laughs> and, um, failing in many cases. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting thing as a playwright to write plays which are about today but use the mm. past. And I think that, you know, given the, what's going on, it feels like the whole world has gone inside out. I mean, there's Brexit, there's... You, Brexit isn't just the only thing. There's Trump and there's Emma Rice losing artistic directorship of the globe. It's all these kind of strange things that are happening. Where do you start? And you can only start from your own stories, I think, and what, you, what inspires you as a writer. And before we open it up to the audience, um, something which um, Kwame mentioned at the beginning, I think um, Tanika did, is um, the range of voices, diversity. Um, so these plays on this subject, Britain in the next um, 10 years, should they be necessarily written in English, um, where should they come from? How wide should the uh, spectrum be? I'm really interested in, in the German playwright that wants to write a play about what they feel about Britain and how they've felt about Britain since we've been in the EU and since Margaret Thatcher. I'm really interested in the French playwright who looks at, um, at what's happened at Calais and what the effect of that. I'm really interested in, in hearing the Polish playwright and their attitude to uh, to ethnic minorities in, in other countries. Um, I'm, 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 I think I find myself fascinated by how we, as playwrights and as artists, find other people across the continent to, to echo, to play with, to write with, to not just, I mean, again, playwriting is often 
perceived as it's this solo thing. And do we want to break that form and find someone else and do it in a different fashion? Because we are in a different time. We are in an instant my story Instagram time. And are we finding ourselves using 19th and 20th century techniques when actually what the calling I feel for my children is, if I want to validate being a playwright, is how am I speaking to the here and now and how am I changing the form? But if those, as I mentioned earlier, if those, for example, those German and French hypothetical plays, should they then be given to Christopher Hampton or someone to mediate for an English audience, or should you try to present them in French or German? I mean, you know, there are, there are foreign movies, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, I absolutely think that it's up to the artistic director to work out his or her audience and whether they have a tolerance to sit there and read subtitles or, or whether it's mixed and it's in English and it's in the original language. I, I don't know. But I certainly think that the prism that we find ourselves in which only privileges English, particularly when we're speaking about internationalism, is problematic. And the next generation below us don't view the world in exactly the same way. And if we don't do anything, even talking amongst ourselves primarily about the English take or the British take on Brexit seems insular and 20th century. Um, anyone else pick up well, on Well, one thing yeah. I would pick up on is, okay. I mean, you can talk, you know, what about, what about diversity within British, British writing? I mean, we talked about having um, voices, non, you know, not just having a white voice, but also what about, uh, we, and obviously wanting a, a, wom a woman, women's voices, but also class. I mean, it, there's been a big lot of stuff in the papers recently about the fact that, that, you know, working class people cannot go to drama school. Now, there's a real link between being an actor and being a writer, and I've got Harold Pinter being a famous one. I was once an actor, I'm sure. Kwame was an actor. Do you know what I mean? So once you, you were, okay, so look, on this, so you're... Just interesting, how, how many of the playwrights didn't start as an actor. You, you weren't an actor, were you, James? No, not a paid one. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure that defines yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really the Oh, point. not. <laughs> Rosemary, were you? No. 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 OK, well, sorry, go but on. OK, yeah. but I mean, that's just one little kind of example yeah. of how the fact that you're just going to get a narrower group of people being able to work in the theatre, getting into, you know, economically, you're, the voices are going to be less, and so you're not even going to have diversity. Talk about a debate about Brexit. Well, you're wiping away the people that actually you might want to hear from. So that's another kind of form of diversity that we, you know, that unless things change, we're not going to have those voices. You say, say goodbye to Andrew Dunbar's of this world. Yeah, we haven't mentioned at all the wider context of this, which is that we have the um, head of the Arts Council here. Um, you'd have to be, you'd have to put your tin hat on as a subsidised theatre if you commissioned a French play about Brexit, say, and put it on, because certain politicians, certain journalists would get quite um, aerated about it, wouldn't they? Uh, so, and it's not to say it shouldn't happen, but you'd have to be ready for that as a, as a theatre. Yes. Yes, then, then what are we doing? Yes. Mm. I mean, like, well, like well, you know, I don't think anyone here sat down and looked at the tyranny of the blank page and said, guess what, I'm going to worry about what critic or what, and, you know, you, you just can't. You've got to shut that out and you've got to be true to what you feel. And I'm absolutely certain that there are many artistic directors who will say, in a mixed environment, in a season of six or eight plays, can I afford to do that? Well, possibly. And then I'll put on an American musical next to make up for the deficit. I mean, who, you know, <laughs> I, I absolutely think that, that you can. I think we could be talking about anything and uh, there'll be a diversity problem with the people writing the plays, I think. Um, in, in it, and I think, I think there's an odd parallel with the Brexit debate and how, how white and male it was. Um, I, think, I, 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 th I think we're maybe slightly getting better. We're, we're at least talking about it now. Um, but but um, I, th I think class is a big one. I think, I think Leave voters, uh, uh, right, uh, I mean, we, we could ask Julian Fellows. Um, um, but I think, um, I, I, think, I think we have a real problem with... with uh, because I, I, I certainly struggle with um, uh, authenticity um, um, when trying to write about, say, somebody of the right, whether I have... Um, I have the right. <laughs> no. Um, 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 so it, it, it seems a very um, remainy establishment thing to start adopting other people's positions and, uh, and, and, and then arguing against it. 
um, and putting these shows on in buildings with royal in the title. Um, uh, I, I, th I think we do have a problem. And, 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 and if there can be positives from something like the political situation we're in, maybe we start looking at the structures, uh, and that would be useful. I think. Just for reopening up to the audience, um, I promised the organiser, I'd mention this last, because it's a personal obsession of mine, but they thought um, <laughs> everyone would fall asleep, which is the effect of the um, Fixed-Term Parliament Act on political playwriting, of which James is beneficiary, because for the first time in 2015, theatres knew when the election would be, which they never previously had. It had always been, and um, so the vote was um, Josie Rourke and James were able to do uh, the Donmar. Um, that's gone again now. We, we simply, again, don't know when the next election might be. I mean, it might be Tuesday, the way things are going, but you never know. So that, has, that does make political playwriting harder. Um, or does it? I don't know. Uh, uh, only, only, no, probably not. Only if you wanted to do a stupid thing like do a play about the general election on the election night, which is what we did in 2015, and it was the only time we did it because it was the only time we could ever yeah. do that because we could plan two years in advance, and like you say, we can't do that now. Mm -hmm. No, I think I'm less worried about that. I think the questions we're asking are bigger and broader and, and, and require a longer lens than, um, than responding to events in that way. Okay, we're moving towards the announcements. So... Um, if we, I don't know if we can bring the light over, we can see you anyway. Um, so we've got a couple of microphones out there. Um, if you'd like, someone on this side, oh, we have all the lights up. Anyone on that side like to wave for a microphone? Um, don't be shy, please. Anyone in the middle? Yes. Getting a microphone around. As I say, even if you think you need no introduction, please do introduce yourself. Hello, you. I'm Yasmin Sidwar. I'm artistic director of Mandala Theatre Company. And I suppose I want to throw the question to you, is theatre within Brexit or without Brexit relevant because half the people that we're talking about who possibly voted to leave can't afford to go to the theatre. So it's a much bigger thing. I've been in theatre all my life, 25, 30 years, but I feel it's even harder to get other voices to even listen to anything in theatre because it's not in school, it's not valued in school, people don't see their stories on stage. So is it a dying art for the privileged? And I would hate to think that because I spend every day focused on it, but I do think it's a question we've got to talk about. Uh, who would like to take that on? Rosemary. Um, yeah, it, it, it is definitely for the privileged, but uh, I think for Brexit, I think we've got to imagine much more different things. Like, I think we could have a play in Northern Ireland on the border and actually have it on the border and at the most important parts of the land. That I, I just think we can make big, state, bold statements with theatre in Brexit. Although, well, depending on the outcome of the Brexit talks, half the audience might need visas to get in to see the, uh, <laughs> to see, to see the play. Yeah, yeah great. Right. Yeah. Makes it harder, yeah, which would. is actually, <laughs> actually better in a way, yes. I think, um, to answer your question, I think what we've got to do is kind of almost like what my English teacher, Mr McKenna, did for me when I was 14. Um, he just he threw a play at me, and it was uh, Class Century by Nigel Williams, and he just said, read that. And I read it, and what jumped at me, I just thought, oh my God, this is about me. This is about me, my friends, my, my, and at school. And I just remember being so excited and so elated. So the whole notion of theatre at the time, when I thought that was, that, that was for the privileged, was knocked, was knocked back. And I just feel, yes, in spite of, yes, theatre's charging the earth for tickets, which is, you know, problematic and needs to be dealt with. But ultimately, you know, Artists you know, like us, we, you know, we need to do just that. You know, um, if they don't come to us, fine, then we'll go to them, go to the schools and, and, sh and, and share. This is why I love theatre. Uh, Kwame Dan James. Yeah. Um, this is an issue, of course, is that people of colour um, have faced for time immemorial, in that invariably it is perceived that you're writing this narrative from your cultural lens, and invariably um, the audience will be majority white. And, and also you have to do translation for that. But here's, um, here's, here's the plus side, particularly for political playwrights, is that if you write a play about a circumstance that is being played to the people who can change the circumstance, you have done service, you have been in service. And I think that's the lie, if it is a lie, that I give myself, that I go, that I, that I go you know, there are circumstances that 
that many, in terms of class and race have to super and gender, have to supersede. And, uh, and I'm putting that play on in front of the people who can change the circumstances. And I, for me, that's phenomenally important. James. No, I couldn't agree more. I feel that very strongly with my own attempts at that, however successful or not. Um, I was just going to fly a flag, as, as Roy did for education. It was for me, it was that I went to a comprehensive school in a working class area in the town that was the seventh highest leave vote. Um, I wouldn't be here without my, without my teacher. It was the, the edu education is the equalizing effect, and I think that is, I have a bit of a personal problem with the EBAC. We can argue about that in a different debate, but how you prioritize that. I was also just going to uh, question or provoke the idea, though, that the, this idea that people keep saying that the Leave vote is a right wing vote. There are left wing Leave voters. There's a, a Lexit, which uh, <laughs> sounds like a really bad club in Leeds. Um, there is. Um, there's also, it's not all working class, actually it's not all um, poor. There is, you know, I know lots of, I know lots of Labour Lords who voted to, to, I don't know them, they're not my mates, but I know of them <laughs> who voted to leave, so it's... The, it's, um, the Labour Party leader is quite equivocal about... I, yeah. I mean, discuss. Yeah. Uh, as discussed in Labour of Love, I would imagine. Tickets available for £10, actually. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there you go. <clears throat> um, anyone on this side? Please don't be shy. We've got time for a few more. Yes, there's one there. We get round there, and then if we get one round to on this side as well, then we'll do both. Yeah, thank you. Um, Daniel Buckroyd, artistic director of the Mercury Theatre in Colchester. Just a thought: we were to, talking about um, uh, trying to get a long lens on this because it's moving so fast, and and all of the comments were about pulling back into the past, and uh, the other opportunity is to project into the future. Uh, we've, we've got a, a new play that we're producing next year which uh, Im imagines just over the horizon, five years ahead, and, and, and looks back on what we're at now. Uh, is a anyone else looking uh, to the future? Um, anyone? Yes, because you, you could indeed write about the future of the Irish border. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah. I, I think writing about the future is great. I know um, I've written, I've done that many t times with Planet Belfast. I was imagining about... Um, about politics in the future and it, it wasn't current but it, you can go more extreme and that is the benefits of writing futuristically totally i mean i did i i did mention that you can look sometimes a bit stupid because in retrospect because you have predicted what is not going to happen but the the benefits is that you can you can just imagine amazing things and go as far as possible uh, yes, and over there, please. Holyman, I'm one of the directors of a theatre company called Little Earthquake, based up in Birmingham. Um, I wondered what the panel thought theatre for young children might look like post-Brexit, who are way below voting age to influence what's going on, but are very much living through what's going on, and might maybe want theatre to help them make sense of what they see happening. Theatre for young people. The Teletubbies do Brexit. <laughs> do, um, any views on that? I or? think you make yeah. it bilingual and you make it uh, multinational. And, uh, and they'll just take it as the way of the world, no matter where um, the adults have led them or what dodgy path the, the adults <laughs> have led them down. Um, introduce to the children the world that you want. And I think they'll, they'll have the intelligence to, uh, yeah. to, to make that world happen, if not in our lifetime certainly in theirs. Okay, we're just um, moving towards the big announcement we've been previewing, but I don't like people go home sad not having asked questions, so yeah, anyone... Well, there is, yes, over there. We get a... You just keep your hand raised slightly, we'll get the microphone there. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Vipan uh, uh, Narang. Um, you've talked a lot about the theatre is the historical voice, and it's an important record, and hence why irrespective of the audience, it has a reach and an influence. I read a very similar thing about um, the cinema yesterday, that you're in a confined space, as opposed to watching things on Sky or elsewhere with people watching at different times, disparate things, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, so whilst this is all very important and doing this is very important, if you think about Brexit and why Brexit happened, whether it was people who were left-leaning or right-leaning, a lot of them bought into, bought into the lies a lot of them also sense in their own communities things had changed far too much and they weren't um, prepared for that change. So 
I haven't heard too much about those kind of stories. I know that um, Kwame talked a bit about it, about you understood from the perspective of somebody, I think you said earlier on, a, a sort of um, in, 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 in the States many, many years ago. So how, come, how can perhaps yourselves as playwrights put more of that across so the people who did vote for Brexit are more able to understand that there is a different way of looking at this? Well, that's really what we started with, is whether you were trying to persuade people to change their mind or um, to reflect the opinions they have? Oh, God. Um, I, I, I don't think I would want to do what, 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 what you're suggesting. I, 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 yes, I mean, I have my opinions on Brexit. But um, again, I, I, would, I would want to be, OK, well, then convince me, uh, leavers. Why, why are we doing this? What's the, you know, where are we going to be in five to 10 years time? You know, talk, you know, tell me, don't just um, give me glib answers. Give me con you know, concrete stuff for me to, for me to process and, and engage, and then, and then I'll take I'll take that away and and use that to 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 influence the work that I do, the write, i.e., the writing, and that's that's all I can do really. Kwame, um, I, I think my job as a writer is to be a catalyst for a debate. I have to love everybody on there, and I have to secretly know where I want the debate to go, but be really willing to know that it may not go there. Um, but ultimately um, catalyze the thing that I think is important. And so in, in relation to Brexit, whichever way, whether it was whichever way class voted and whichever way, you know, left or right, um, it's, it's far more important that, that I find a way through art to articulate that we are living in a borderless world increasingly and that nationalism actually is relatively self-defeating and we need to, though it serves many things, but that ultimately um, I, as a diasporic African who describes myself as tricultural, African, Caribbean, and British, which is great at the World Cup time, um, <laughs> and, uh, that, that, that being tricultural feeds me, makes me have a greater perspective on the world, gives me a way in, and ultimately, if we're going to be competitive as an economy and as a country, it lies in looking at the world as one and not through the narrow lens of one nationality. My job is to catalyze the debate to take us there. I'm now American, so you're quad cultural now, aren't you? Oh, no, no, I'm not American. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, April. No, I was just going to say, in a way, you can't write about Brexit, because whatever you write about ostensibly in a play, you're always really writing about something else. And um, that's just a curious thing about plays, or maybe, you know, that's what people have been talking about, about metaphor. You could be writing about Brexit, but you could be writing on the surface, but underneath what's really driving the play could be um, something, you know, well, take your pick. Mm. And on that, <laughs> just before we um, hear the announcement, um, it seems to be important that, that um, people uh, are often told, Remainers are often told, look, it's over, it was 52, 48. Something looking 10 years ahead, it's, it's deciding where we are at any particular point. I mean, who knows um, if even individual places are still at the vote they were no, on I the day of the referendum. Away, well, we don't, don't know, but I mean, that's yeah, one of the things. Yeah. But, but that's something that pl the plays would have to reflect. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, going back to that whole question about would you write a play about Brexit? I mean, I, for me, as a playwright, and I think for mo most people, it's about the characters that you meet. And so, for example, the, the Ugandan Asian shopkeeper who's complaining about all the polls that are turning up. You know, that's, that's, a, great, uh, that's a great scenario. <laughs> and it would cause a lot of trouble, and it would be a great play, and it would be about Brexit. So it's that sort of thing where we find different ways of telling, telling that Brexit story, and it's not necessarily just like, you know, hard, we're gonna write a play about Brexit. It, it, I don't think we think like that, because otherwise then it's, we're just journalists then, we're not, we're not playwrights. And, and also to just pick up on April's point earlier about Brexit being a, maybe a symptom, and I know I've, I've uh, uh, fell into the trap of dividing it right and left and da -da -da myself, but, um, we also can fall into the trap as though the relief vote was the vote that, that's the, that was the vote of the, of, of the lie. Um, well, actually, I think all of us could feel a sense that things weren't quite right with the status quo. And with, we, we're kind of t t told that, that, that hard work is what, is what can define us whilst, whilst we're seeing rising inequality in food banks. We're, we're being told that at the moment this tyrant is the bad guy. Well, we were kind of selling arms to them not that long ago. You know, the, 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 the constant lies of, the, of, 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 of Remain, of, of the establishment, um, we just maybe have slightly articulated 
our frustration with that in a different way than the Leave voter. Um, but I think if we were to address Brexit in this kind of way, it's to see, see, see what's behind Brexit, what, what, what's at the root of it. And I think what's the root of it is a kind of alienation from, from what, what our lived experience and what we're being told. And, yeah. Well, thank you very much to Brad Birch, Tanita Gupta, Kwame Kweyama, um, April DeAngelis, James Graham, Roy Williams, and Rosemary Jenkinson. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There you are. Thank you. Um, so the final part of the evening before the drinks and canapes, um, I'm going to invite two people to the stage. Uh, one is James Dacre, who is Artistic Director of Northampton's Royal and Durmgate Theatres, which um, happens to be my local theatre, in case you think we're all the smug London elite. <laughs> smug maybe, but not um, uh, London necessarily. Um, and I'm going there tomorrow night to see Rules for Living, uh, which I'm looking forward to. And David Gregg, Artistic Director of Edinburgh's The Lyceum, where I was... Um, last month. So welcome to stage please, um, James uh, Dacre and David Gregg. I'd like to start by thanking Vicky Hayward for her welcome this evening and Sir Nicholas uh, Sorota for his introduction and uh, also to the RSA for hosting tonight's symposium. Many, many huge thanks also, Mark, for chairing tonight's wonderful debate, and to Brad, Tanika, James, April, Roy, Rosemary, and Kwame for such an interesting debate and such wonderful contributions. It's a rare and a wonderful thing to see playwrights on stage, and I'm very, very grateful that all of you have joined us tonight for this symposium. And thank you also to you, the audience, for coming. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's discussion and that you'll have, as a result of this evening, plenty to think about and reflect upon subsequently. Now, one theme that has very clearly emerged from our discussion tonight is just how uncertain the future is. Mark referenced earlier that famous, that famous Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Now, there's no doubt that the next 10 years are gonna be very interesting times indeed for Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and Europe. And we at the Royal and Dan Gate in Northampton, the Royal Lyceum Theatre in Edinburgh, the Lyric Theatre in Belfast, and the Sherman Theatre in Cardiff believe that they'll also make for some pretty interesting theatre also. And that's why we've joined together to embark upon an ambitious project which we've titled Nations on the World Stage. This epic cycle of plays will respond both to Brexit, but more importantly, to the political and the ideological divisions that the referendum has exposed across our country. And we're bringing together a diverse group of emerging and established artists, thinkers, practitioners, and audiences from across Europe to continue the debate on our stages that we began here tonight. So over the next decade, we'll create work which can offer unique insights into our nation's past and our present, but which we hope also will in their own way imagine the possibilities for these four nations' future. The details of this commissioning process and indeed the first commissions are going to be announced soon. Our vision is that they will be performed in each of the home nations, but also across Europe and beyond and that ultimately they will be published in an anthology that offers a lasting picture of what England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales thought about their particular places in the world during this period of monumental change. And so to finish, I'm going to hand it over to David for some concluding remarks. Um, thank you very much, James. Um, I just wanted to make some thoughts about why I think plays and theatre are the right place to do this. In 1948, uh, not a stone's throw from this building, a play called Cockpit um, had its debut by an Anglo-British writer called Bridget Boland. Um, in it, the play begins with uh, two British soldiers guarding a theatre in southern Germany filled with displaced persons and refugees trying to work out where they're going to go next. It's an extraordinary immersive piece of work that does the bold thing of turning Europe into a metaphor, at least the metaphor being a theatre, the whole of Europe as a theatre. And in 1948, 
neither Bridget Boland nor the characters in the play knew uh, in which direction Europe might go. We're restaging the play at the Royal Lyceum in a month or so's time, so it's been very much on my mind. And at the read-through, I was immensely moved by this sense um, that Boland had captured a moment, but in capturing that moment um, and finding the right metaphor, she offered something to us now, which was to throw up the question of what it took to make the Europe that we have today and also what potentially we might be losing um, by departing from it. Um, we live in a time of binaries. Uh, if you're Scottish, uh, this is not the only referendum that we've been through recently. Um, we've also had two elections. Uh, so in Scotland, there's yes and no. There's leave and remain. Uh, there's left and right. Um, the, and every single combination within of these fractal divisions. Um, uh, uh, and, and so, uh, in a sense, um, theatre is the perfect vehicle for us to explore the different identities thrown up within that because theatre, by its nature, is multi-perspective. Uh, um, I also think it's important because, um, as was acknowledged before by the thought of the civic function of art, something happens when political questions are brought into contact with art. The nature of the space changes, the nature of the debate changes from these binaries into something much more fluid, something much more empathic, something much more disrupted. As Roy said, we get to see some of the cracks in between. Um, I think when that's true of art generally, it's, it's even particularly true of theatre and particularly true of the play. Um, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones was once asked why, you know, whether they were a political band or not. And he said something along the lines of, no, nah, we were never really interested in writing any songs about Ted Heath. Um, <laughs> I think there's a sense in which all the playwrights tonight have shown that um, uh, when we think about political theatre, we're not talking about the Michael Gove play or, or write it, perhaps now we could write about Ted Heath, actually, I think it would be quite interesting, James, that's one for you. But, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, that sense in which the way the Rolling Stones write a song like Street Fighting Man or Sympathy for the Devil in response to their times and they capture a moment and they capture a mood, um, I expect this cycle of plays to find within it um, moments where it captures the, the time um, uh, and the energy of the time. Um, the, Ly the Lyceum is incredibly excited to collaborate uh, on this project and um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank James for getting us all together on behalf of Jimmy Fayer, the Lyric and Rachel at the Sherman um, as, as well. Um, I think uh, uh, it, it's, it's worth saying that we're not looking to create plays about Europe. I think it's something different. I think we're looking to create from theatre and from plays a space in which we can discover ourselves and we can discover where we are in relation to the big civic questions of the day. And I'd like to close with my favourite quote uh, from John Liley, the uh, Elizabethan playwright, who uh, said, they complain that our plays are all mingle-mangle, but it's not our fault because the whole world has gone hodgepodge. <laughs> so, um, on that note, and with a suitably European uh, flavour, I'd like from Scotland to uh, salute the old alliance and propose that uh, we all venture forth uh, uh, to have a glass of French claret. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to James and David and again to all the panel. Your French claret and alternative beverages are available now in the Benjamin Franklin room at a drinks reception. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well done, everyone. Thank you very much. That was great. So are you.